public defender in Orange County. I've been doing criminal defense for 16 years. And the last eight years has been um, <clears throat> exclusively serious felonies, uh, murders, um, and very violent uh, behavior. <clears throat> but I want to um, talk to you about a, a law that I think uh, provides us with some, some hope and some optimism for the future, um, but also has um, some significant uh, hurdles that still need to be overcome in order to implement what is sought, which is racial justice. So California passed a law last year, went into effect January 1st of this year called the Racial Justice Act. And the Racial Justice Act says that the state shall not seek or obtain a criminal conviction or seek, obtain, or impose a sentence on the basis of race, ethnicity, or national origin, which I'm gonna keep referring to here uh, through the slides with R slash E slash N O. And I apologize for being uh, a lawyer and heavy here on the text, but I think uh, this is the best way to communicate what, what this law does. Now, the Racial Justice Act saying, you know, seeks to uh, remedy the, what we know is historically is a unfair uh, system to people who uh, are, are minorities in, in general. And I think we should begin this conversation by talking about recognizing that the, the modern uh, police system and the moder crim modern criminal processing system still grows out of uh, the origins of, of, of slavery. Its roots are still in, in slavery. And then the 13th Amendment was passed after the Civil War. Uh, people think slavery was banned in this country, and it wasn't. It was banned except for as punishment for a crime. And so what continued to happen, particularly in the South, but I think uh, across America, is that um, in, in particular, black men were arrested and uh, forced into slavery through the, through the policing system. And, that, and this continues to today. Now, the Racial Justice Act, first of all, has a severe limitation in that it only applies prospectively to cases where judgment has not been entered prior to January 1st of this year. Anybody who is sentenced January 1st of this year or after is gonna receive the benefit of this law. Anybody who is sentenced in the past does not receive the benefit of this law. There is a bill pending. It's Assembly Bill 256, which seeks to make the, rest, the um, Racial Justice Act retroactive to cases where judgment was entered prior to January 1st. That's pending in the legislature right now. It's moved through um, committee and I'm hopeful that it will eventually make it to the governor's desk and, and be signed into law. But right now it's a, it's a really big limitation as far as achieving racial justice. <clears throat> so when the legislature passes a, a law, they often make declarations. The legislature finds this and therefore we enact this law. And, and there's, a lot of hope and optimism in these declarations, um, but I think ultimately the, the law has some, some difficulties in implementing the goals. So here are the, some of the declarations. Discrimination in our criminal justice system based on race, ethnicity, or national origin has deleterious effects, not only on the individual criminal defendants, but on our system of justice as a whole. The United States Supreme Court has recognized the impact of evidence of racial bias cannot be measured simply by how much airtime it received at trial or how many pages it occupies in the record. 
some toxins can be deadly in small doses. Discrimination undermines public confidence in the fairness of the state's system of justice and deprives Californians of equal justice under the law. The United States Supreme Court Justice has observed that the way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to speak openly and candidly on the subject of race and apply the Constitution with eyes open to the unfortunate effects of centuries of racial discrimination. We cannot simply accept the stark reality that race pervades our system of justice. Rather, we must acknowledge and seek to remedy the reality and create a fair system of justice that upholds our democratic ideals. These things are now uh, codified, okay? The legislature in California has recognized that these things are in fact true, that they are pervasive in our criminal justice system and that they need to be fixed. Uh, again, this is the California Racial Justice Act. It applies only to California cases. Further declarations, even though racial bias is widely acknowledged as intolerable in our criminal justice system, it nevertheless, nevertheless persists because courts generally only address racial bias in the most extreme and blatant forms. Even when racism clearly infects the criminal proceeding, the current legal precedent under current legal precedent, proof of purposeful discrimination is often required, but not nearly, but nearly impossible to establish. It's not hard to imagine um, a, a situation, uh, a comment, uh, something that could happen that would be, um, you know, overtly racist and uh, easy to identify by. Uh, a judge um, or an appellate judge as something that led to an unfair prosecution or trial for a defendant. But there are um, uh, infinite possibilities of uh, ways with through uh, you know, implicit bias and microaggressions that racism still interferes with uh, the criminal justice system. <clears throat> and so I wanna kind of weave into this a little bit, um, a story about a case that, uh, that Deborah and I worked on in Orange County. And for a client of mine who I'm gonna call Damon. <clears throat> and Damon was a, is a young black man, he was, uh, 25 when he was arrested for his offense and he was charged as a third striker. Because when he was 16, <clears throat> after he had been uh, removed from his home due to neglect and abuse, <clears throat> uh, shuffled through the foster care system uh, and, and suffered uh, quite a few traumatic incidents. Uh, he ended up uh, in a situation where he didn't hurt anybody, but he was arrested and received uh, multiple strikes under California's three strikes law. And now as a 25 year old, he found himself uh, charged as a third striker. Uh, Damon uh, is an African-American and he was in a convenience store and he offered, he made an act of kindness and an offer to a white gentleman in the, in the store. And that white gentleman, rather than responding or accepting the act of kindness, turned and gave a hard stare to Damon. That lasted about, uh, 45 seconds, the refusal to even speak to him. And after that, uh, he challenged him to a fight. The white man challenged Damon to a fight. He asked him to step outside where he took his shirt off, exposing his uh, tattoos. And 
eventually a fight did ensue. And my client, Damon, he threw one punch. But that punch connected and it knocked the white man out. The white man fell in the street and he suffered a head injury and, and brain damage. The judge eventually sentenced uh, my client Damon to a life sentence for that one punch. Uh, before that, we put on testimony where we tried to um, convey to the judge where we tried to ask the judge to do something that has been talked about here today, which is to look at it from someone else's perspective. How would a black man in that situation feel? A black man who's been through a lifetime of trauma, how would he feel when that white man turns at him and stares without talking for 45 seconds? and then asks him to step outside to fight and takes his shirt off. And the judge, first of all, the prosecutor objected when I uh, tried to introduce that evidence and the judge sustained the objection and said it was irrelevant. It was irrelevant uh, how he would feel. <clears throat> The legislative declarations go on here. Current legal precedent often results in courts sanctioning racism in criminal trials. Existing precedent countenances racially biased testimony, including expert testimony and arguments in criminal trial. For example, a court upheld a conviction based in part on an expert's racist testimony that people of Indian descent are predisposed to commit bribery. This is a recent case where an expert testified, people of Indian descent are predisposed to commit bribery. There's an example of overt racism that will uh, now have a remedy. Existing precedent has provided no recourse for defendants who, whose own attorney harbors racial animus towards the defendant's racial group or towards the defendant, even where the, atten the attorney routinely used racist language and harbored deep and utter contempt for the defendant's racial group. These are examples that the legislature is citing to of things that actually happens. And the court said, even if it's not okay, we're not gonna do anything about it. Existing precedent holds that appellate courts must defer to the rulings of judges who make racially biased comments during jury selection. Again, these are, these are not my words. These are the findings of the legislature about the state of the law in California prior to the passage of the Racial Justice Act. Existing precedent tolerates the use of racially incendiary or racially coded language, images, and racial stereotypes in criminal trials. For example, courts have upheld convictions in cases where prosecutors have compared defendants who are people of color to Bengal tigers and other animals, even while acknowledging that such statements are highly offensive and inappropriate. Because the use of animal imagery is historically associated with racism, use of animal imagery in reference to a defendant is racially discriminatory and should not be permitted in our court system. Existing precedent also accepts racial disparities in our criminal justice system as inevitable. Most famously in 1987, the United States Supreme Court found that there was a, dis a discrepancy that appears to correlate with race in death penalty cases in Georgia, but the court would not intervene without proof of discriminatory purpose. And so if the prosecutor is not saying, I want the death penalty because this defendant is black, that's there. It, he's not racist enough for for the for the United States Supreme Court to do anything about it. Uh, 
the, the legislature acknowledges that all persons possess implicit, implicit biases and these biases impact the criminal justice system. And that negative implicit bias tends to disfavor people of color. And in California in 2020, we can no longer accept racial discrimination and racial disparities as inevitable in our criminal justice system. And we must act to make clear that this discrimination and these disparities are illegal and will not be tolerated in California both prospectively and retroactively is the declaration of the legislation. However, the retroactive portion of the law was removed before uh, the law was passed and signed in as code. There's a growing awareness that no degree or amount of racial bias is tolerable in a fair and criminal justice system and racial bias is often insidious and that purposeful discrimination is often masked and racial animus disguised. The examples described here are but a few select instances of intolerable racism infecting decision-making and criminal justice systems. Examples of the racism that pervade the criminal justice system are too numerous to list. And so I want to go back to uh, Damon and his case and the judge's uh, declaration that it's that the issue of race in his case was irrelevant. Because what they're going to say is um, you know, we specifically said race wasn't uh, a factor here. We, we declared that we were anti-racist. But, but in the failure to uh, see things from my client's perspective, uh, it, it is actually the, the exact evidence of the racism. And it's not just the racism of that judge or the DA, it's uh, the, the, the entire criminal processing system and how the, it, it, at every stage along the way, uh, dis discriminates against um, people who are, who are poor and people are, who are of color. So the declarations here are now recognizing implicit bias, unintentional and unconscious uh, racism that infects the trials. And my job will be to unravel some of these um, situations and create a record of the implicit, un unintentional and unconscious bias that infected someone's trial in order to try to get their sentence reduced, get their conviction thrown out or get them a new trial. This is going to take um, a lot of work and it's gonna require expert testimony of people who can come in and, and explain implicit bias, unintentional and unconscious racism to a judge who uh, as of now can still be the same judge who sentenced the person in the first place. And uh, I'm gonna need help with that. So if anybody here has ideas after this uh, or thinks that there's something that they can offer, I, I would love to speak with you. Okay, so what does the Racial Just Justice Act actually say? It says that, um, a violation is established if the defendant proves any of the following. That a judge, an attorney in the case, a law enforcement officer, an expert witness, or a juror exhibited bias or animus towards the defendant because of the defendant's race, ethnicity, national origin. So that includes any attorney in the case, including the defendant's attorney. It does not include a racist victim. It does not include a racist witness unless that racist witness is uh, 
a police officer. So we talked a little bit about, about uh, Huntington Beach today. And uh, this is an article from three days ago, <clears throat> which I already had in my, in my PowerPoint slide prior to Huntington Beach coming up here at the conference. Okay. And I like to take, you know, current events and put them in to talks like this and it never takes me too long you know it's never too it hasn't been very long since the most recent example of whatever problem uh i want to talk about has happened and so you know this isn't um necessarily a, a racial issue but some huntington police uh beach huntington beach police officers were using slurs uh that were caught on their body cameras against uh, some transgendered women. And not only were they using slurs, but the women had uh, told the police on the body camera that they had been assaulted by some other men. And on the body camera, one of them is, one of the uh, transgender women is, is bleeding from the head. And the officers, didn't document the injury and they didn't write down the statement from the woman that she was the one who had been a victim of assault. Instead, they took only the other party statements that the two transgender women were the uh, perpetrators of the violence and they charged those two transgender women. They were arrested, taken to jail and recently went through uh, preliminary hearing where the body cameras were, uh, videos were played and the officers had to admit that they did not include those things in their report, explaining that they forgot. <clears throat> now there are cases like this under the Racial Justice Act, there would be uh, a remedy. Uh, however, it doesn't include gender discrimination. But this is an example of uh, you know, something more overt where it's gonna be easy to get, to get a remedy. Most cases are gonna be uh, more nuanced. So number one way to get a remedy, you can show a violation of uh, overt racism, okay? by a, a player from the, from the state involved in the case. Number two, you can show uh, that during the trial, someone used uh, racially discriminatory language or otherwise exhibited bias or animus toward the defendant uh, due to race. And this does not include if a witness is testifying to to some language that that somebody else said, you know, I heard I heard the defendants say this, or I heard the victims say this. Um, that kind of stuff would be excluded. It would have to be um, uh, first person. Number three, if the defendant was charged with a more serious offense, than uh, than is typically charged against people of a different race. So, for instance, um, for instance, they seek um, more serious charges or felony charges against, uh, they tend to seek felony charges against people who are of color, but misdemeanor charges against people who are white that's gonna establish uh, a violation. Now, all of these violations have to be proven by the, by the individual county. And so Orange County has to be compared against Orange County data. LA County has to be compared against LA County data. 
And so you have to show the, the, the discrimination within the county. So it's county specific, more serious charge or conviction, and also for, for the individual, more serious charge or conviction, but also that the state sought more serious charges or convictions from, per, from persons of the defendant's race, ethnicity, or national origin. Another way to show a violation is to show that uh, a more severe sentence was imposed against persons of the defendant's uh, class, or that a more serious sent more serious sentence were imposed when the victims were of a, a certain class. So, uh, in in Damon's case, do do the prosecutors only seek what uh, life sentences? for black on white crime? Or do they also see it, seek it for black on black? And do they also seek it for white on white? So that this portion is also county specific. It's looking at the length of the sentence and you can show a violation by showing longer sentences against the persons of the defendant's uh, class or longer longer sentences for persons of the victims. So what can, what happens after that? You sh if you show a violation, um, you can file it, you can file this motion. This can be filed before the trial. And an example of that would be saying, hey, uh, you only charge, uh, you know, when, when someone is stabbed, you charge uh, attempt murder against uh, black defendants, but you charge assault with a with a deadly weapon against white defendants. I want I want this person's charges lowered from attempt murder to assault with a deadly weapon. Or it could be a motion filed after trial, saying um, uh, for this kind of crime, black defendants received an average of twenty years, but white defendants received the average of ten years. So I want the sentence reduced to 10 years. You have to make uh, some kind of prima facie showing, an initial showing of a violation that if what you're saying is true, that would establish a substantial likelihood that a violation occurred. And if we can show that, we can then present um, more evidence, statistical evidence, expert testimony, uh, or testimony of other witnesses where we try to prove by a preponderance that uh, there was some discrimination involved in the case. And at the end of the case, the court has to make findings on the record. In order to show something like this, uh, we need probably, we, we need the data, right? We need to know what are the sentences that uh, the, the DA's office sought for black defendants versus white defendants versus Hispanic defendants. And uh, that has been one of, one of the big hurdles thus far um, because the prosecutor's offices don't wanna give us the data. And the judges have not given us the data. But if we, can establish uh, a violation, then there's a list of remedies. And it, the court shall impose a remedy specific to the violation found from the following list. And before a judgment, the court may impose uh, following remedies, declare a mistrial. Okay, if something happened, uh, you know, a racial slur is used in the middle of the trial, then you can ask for a, a mistrial. The jury goes home and you start all over again with a new jury. Okay, discharge the jury panel and impanel a new jury. If during jury selection, somebody does something, uh, you get rid of those jurors. We might be 60 of them or 100 that we're trying to narrow down to 12 people who can be uh, fair to both sides. So you can get a new panel. Uh, or if the court determines to be in the interest of justice, the court could dismiss enhancements, special circumstances or allegations or reduce charges. During the trial, or before the trial. If, if a judgment has been entered already, if somebody's already sentenced, the court can find uh, that the, the sentence is invalid and can 
reduce the charges, can reduce the sentence, uh, or can grant a new trial. The court cannot um, increase the sentence after finding a violation. Another option uh, is if the court finds a violation in a death penalty case, that the death penalty is taken off the table. Uh, more frequently sought or obtained, this is one of the things that we have to show to show the um, purpose, not purposeful, but even uh, I guess uh, accidental discrimination. Uh, that might result from, from implicit biases. This is where we, we need um, really statisticians, stat, st statistics people who can come in and present the evidence. Now we do have a pretty good uh, definition here of racially discriminatory language, it means language that to an objective observer explicitly or implicitly appeals to racial bias, including but not limited to racially charged or racially coded language, language that compares the defendant to an animal or language that references the defendant's physical appearance, culture, ethnicity, or natural, national origin. Evidence that particular words or images are used excessively or disproportionately in cases where the defendant is of a specific race, ethnicity, or national origin is relevant to determining whether the language is discriminatory. And so we can use other cases to show um, that they use particular language um, against people of certain uh, classes. Now we said in the beginning that this law is, is severely limited in that it is prospective only. It's only applying to cases where the defendant was sentenced January 1st, 2001 going forward. So I wanna remind you again that there is um, a proposed amendment in the works. Uh, we're hopeful that it will pass. That would make the, re the re uh, Racial Justice Act retroactive to cases. And it would still be limited, but it would be limited to people who are still serving a sentence uh, or have an actual or potential immigration consequence related to the conviction of the sentence. And so anybody who you might be aware of who had something like this happen in a case where they were prosecuted and they are still serving time for that, a life sentence or a a sentence that has continued to keep them incarcerated. If this bill passes, they will have a way to reopen those cases to try to show a violation and um, receive some kind of relief pursuant to, the, to this law. So one of the other limitations um, that we've had is that we really haven't had any cooperation from the district attorney's office on, on these issues. And, uh, you know, it, it, in ways that uh, I think kind of reflect how the law has been applied, historically, we've received um, words and not action. So Todd Spitzer is the uh, district attorney uh, of Orange County and he issued this press release days after uh, asking for a life sentence from, from my client Damon, where his lawyer objected to uh, the relevance of race to, to my client's sentence, where he, proclaims that we have uh, engaged in, in mass incarceration in a, in a way that we've prosecuted people of color differently and that he will stop it. So when we've asked for the data, show us what kind of charges you've brought against black people versus white people versus Hispanic people. Show us what kind of sentences you have sought for those kind of people. We've 
received nothing. Uh, I did come into possession of a spreadsheet that was created by the district attorney's office in Orange County prior to the administration of Todd Spitzer. So under the old prosecutor, Tony Rakakis, the ACLU had filed some lawsuits and they obtained data of every case filed by the Orange County district attorney's office in 2017 and 2018. And in 2018, this is a, a example of what we could do to, sh to, to show a violation. 2018, they filed 31 murder cases in Orange County. 12 of these were special circumstance murders. And for those of you who don't know, a special circumstance is something that is required in order for the DA to seek a uh, penalty of death or life imprisonment without parole. Of those 12 cases of the 31 defendants where special circumstances were charged, none of the defendants were white. However, we did find an appellate opinion from one of those cases that indicated that special circumstance murder could have been charged based on the facts and the defendant was a white supremacist gang member. There's a gentleman named Curtis Flowers who was prosecuted in Mississippi for a murder case. And he went through six trials. His case went to the Supreme Court at least twice. Uh, Mr. Flowers is a black man. And in his first four trials, the prosecutor used peremptory excuses to dismiss all 36 black prospective jurors. He was tried each time with an all white jury in Mississippi. And he was sentenced to death four times. His case was reversed um, based on the uh, jury selection four times, two times mistrials were declared. And the last, the very last uh, trial, which was the sixth, sixth time for being on trial, the prosecutor left one black juror. Case had been overturned three times already for kicking off all the black jurors. So this time he left one. And the case went to the Supreme Court and somewhat surprisingly, but I will uh, acknowledge some hope here. The Supreme Court reversed the conviction again and said, there's just too much of a history here of this prosecutor's intention to remove black jurors from the case. Uh, leaving one person here did not fix that. Uh, Mr. Flowers was uh, sent back uh, to Mississippi where the prosecutor's office could uh, seek his seventh trial. And um, at that time, uh, some subsequent developments happened that caused them to question their ability to approve the case and Mr. Flowers' case was dismissed and he was released. But this is a, an extraordinary case and it's merely one person who had the, the pervasive racist uh, prosecution, you know, overturned to, where, to, to, to receive, um, you know, a, a measure of justice. 
So there is another law passed this year, which goes into effect um, next year, which completely revamps um, jury selection in California. And it has some more language uh, that acknowledges the inherent uh, racism in the criminal processing system. If, uh, if you don't know this, so during a jury, during a jury selection, we'll often start off with way more, way, way more than 12 people. The judge questions them, the lawyers question them, and then we're allowed to excuse people. And the, the histories, particularly in the South, it, but um, you know, over time and, and all over America, is for the prosecutor to use those peremptory excuses to excuse black jurors. And, and here's why, okay? Uh, a study done um, in 2004 on death penalty uh, cases found that when there are no black male jurors on the jury, the jury imposes death 72% of the time. One black juror, one person on that jury drops that to 43% and two drops it to 36%. Another study here of over 700 felony trials found, you can see here the potential jurors, if they're all white, 81% uh, conviction rate for black defendants, 66% conviction rate for white defendants. Having one person one black person in the jury pool changes those statistics to 71% conviction for black and 73% for white. It equalizes to have some to have uh, uh, that that kind of to have some amount of diversity in the jury pool. Now, when I walked into the jury selection in Damon's case. Uh, we think we started with 80 people in Orange County in the jury pool. And how, you know how many of them were, were black? Zero. Zero. For the jury of his peers. And so California has um, passed this jury selection reform, which they gave uh, a year leeway for the, the judges to kind of incorporate this because it really is um, pretty revolutionary, I think. In the past, the court had to basically, um, you, uh, the, you could, one of the lawyers could object that the prosecutor was uh, excusing somebody because of, of their race. And then the judge would have to inquire. They would have to say, well, prosecutor, is that, are you doing that because the person, you know, because of the person's race or for a different reason? And if the prosecutor said a different reason, then the person, that, then they get to get rid of, of that juror. That's basically the law all over America. That's the, 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 the Supreme Court decision. It's not, it's, it's illegal to kick people because of their race. But if the prosecutor says it's not because of their race, then that's okay. The jury selection re reform um, addresses unconscious bias and incorporates what have been proxies for uh, prosecutors to excuse persons of color while claiming that they're not doing it. And so the legislature has made a list of things that have been historically used. So as an example, if I'm picking a jury and I have uh, 80 people and one black person, 
And the prosecutor will ask that black person, you know, have you ever had a negative experience with law enforcement? And if that person says, yes, I have had a negative experience, that became the reason to get rid of that person. That was the, that was the unracist reason, okay? Now, so here are the reasons now that are no longer considered valid. The prosecutors can't use these as, as excuses, okay? Distrust of law enforcement. Uh, the belief that officers engage in racial pro profile. Having a close relationship with someone who has been stopped, arrested, or convicted of a crime. The neighborhood you live in. Having a child outside of marriage. Receiving state benefits. Not being an English speaker. The ability to speak a different language. Dress, attire, or personal appearance. Employment in a field that is dis proportionately occupied by some class of people. Lack of employment or underemployment of the juror or the juror's family member. Being friendly to someone of, of the same race. And uh, comparative questions to prospective jurors. This means um, if, uh, if the prosecutor asked uh, a white juror and a black juror the same question and they had the same answer, but then the prosecutor said, well, I'm using that answer to kick the black person, uh, that would be considered invalid. Uh, some other reasons here that have historically been associated with improper discrimination in jury selection. Uh, the prospective juror was inattentive or staring or failing to make eye contact. The prospective juror exhibited either a lack of rapport or problematic attitude, body language, or demeanor, or the prospective juror provided unintelligent or confused answers. Now, the reason that these things are listed is because they are um, unprovable. And, and from a court record on appeal, uh, there's no real way for an appellate judge to go, well, you know, actually that juror wasn't failing to make eye contact. And, and so these are um, essentially bullshit excuses of uh, things that prosecutors have been trained to say uh, in order to justify their uh, excusal of jurors of, uh, of color. <clears throat> The jury selection reform also addresses uh, the tendency of trial judges to offer the prosecutors who can't adequately explain other reasons why maybe they wanted to get rid of that juror so that the prosecutor can then adopt and say, yeah, judge, that is what I, I did mean that. So this is another thing that, that, that has gone on that uh, it is Pro, explicitly prohibited now. And it also applies to um, appellate, juror, appellate courts um, supplementing their belief that, well, you know, the prosecutor could have been thinking this. So that law, uh, the jury selection reform, as I said, it's, it's been passed and it became law January 1st of this year, but it doesn't apply to jury trials until January 1st of next year. There's one final thing I want to, to mention here, which is another bill that, that's pending in the legislature right now. Now, I remember Damon, he had... Um, these juvenile strike priors from when he was 16 years old and the judge imposed those at his sentencing. She didn't have to, but she chose to, to give him a life sentence. And um, 
there are guidelines for judges at sentencing. And the, the guidelines talk about factors and mitigation and reasons that judges can strike um, enhanced sentences due to prior convictions. But they're, uh, they're, they're, they're completely inadequate, the, the factors and mitigation. So there is a, a bill pending SB 81, which would add factors and mitigation that would um, make it relevant what, what a person's perspective was what they've been through, the traumas that they've been through, the reactions that they have because of those traumas. And it would make it so that it would be presumed that the judge should strike those enhancements if the application of the enhancement would result in a disparate racial impact, or if the current offense is connected to prior victimization or childhood trauma. Now. I know through the work that I've done and listening to all of you that almost every offense my, my clients commit is connected to prior victimization or childhood trauma. That's the reason that most of these things happen. But there, if this bill passes, there will be uh, a new opportunity which is going to require educating the court, educating judges about why the current offense is connected to prior victimization or childhood trauma. And this is uh, really a, a whole new uh, field for the criminal justice system that will necessitate uh, expert testimony and help from people who are, are educated on these issues like all of you here today. Um, that's all I have. Again, my name is Adam Vining. I'm at the Orange County Public Defender's Office. Here's my contact information, my email, and my cell phone number. And if you think that you have something uh, that you could offer on cases like this, or you know people who you think could benefit from one of these laws, then, then please let me know. Adam, that was absolutely amazing. And um, we have a few minutes in here, so we can take a few minutes of questions in here. Um, can you stop sharing your screen for a sec? so we can see everybody yes. if you don't mind oh awesome <laughs> so i this case um it was very dear and you know to us both of us we worked out how long did we work on this case quite a, quite a while probably, and they have the yeah probably a year and it's only because we worked on it for so long that he's going to end up being able to benefit from this law because we continued it into <laughs> january to get it past that deadline yeah yeah yeah, I, I and and that's I mean that's takes the prosecutor or or takes a um a lawyer who cares about his client, right? Because you know that case really impacted me a lot. And um the student who helped me with the research is here um for that case, Christina oh, Cortez. Yeah, and she found all those things and helped me put all that together to help him. And I remember talking to her about it, saying there's gotta be something. This is the saddest thing I've ever seen, <laughs> you know, and it was it was a difficult case to get through, you know, but um, I am so glad he is able to benefit from that and, and that there is more that can happen, you know. And I wonder if you have anything you could share about your experience of testifying in front of that that judge and the interaction that happened when we did start talking about race. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You know, I was trying to hide some of my emotion. I saw you heard it on the phone after I called you. I had to go, you know, chill out a little bit. But it was, it was, um, 
you know, there was a lot of racism going on and not the, the racism that you normally think of. It was very systemic. It was very like, this is the system. This is how the system works. So I'm going to apply all these rules and all these laws because I can. And it, I mean, what got me is when she did this, this fits really nicely into, you know, what I was like, this is a person. This is not just some case that you can fit nicely like this into a box. When she did, I was, it was jumping out of my skin because it was just so clear. He did not have a chance from jumpstart. Like his whole life, his family testified, he did not have a chance and she could not see his life from someone else's point of view. No one could in that room, the prosecutors, nobody could, even, even the, the victims that were there with their family couldn't see this situation where he had a part in this. Like it was just, it was a very interesting experience. It's like, it took everything that I had learned and applied in, in my career, like, you know, trying to say, this is exactly why I'm doing this job. You know what I mean? Like, it was that one of those cases. I do know what you mean. <laughs> I mean, Christina, do you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, I mean, that case really messed with me, I think. It was, um, I mean, like, you know, like, emotions-wise, um, it was very blatant that there was a lot of um, racial stuff going on, and I watched the, um, the trial on the YouTube, I think. I forgot how I watched mm -hmm. it. And the judge was just so from my perspective, very careless about his story, careless, not careless, she didn't care, sorry. <laughs> um, she didn't empathize with him. And that was just really sad because, you know, the way that everything just lined up was just so horrible. And, you know, it, it was just, it bothered me that it was, she didn't care really. <laughs> and, and, uh, here's, here's a comment I wanna make. You know, the judge is um, a middle-aged white lady, blonde, south county of orange county she's like the oc okay her parents were both doctors all of her siblings uh, are doctors and she uh, bucked the trend by becoming a lawyer okay the the privilege of of her life just jumps off and and, and so I, I i did get um i was a little um bothered during one of the earlier sessions about uh, talking about seeing things through the perspective of, of the police officer, because uh, the police officer should see things through the perspective of my client. And, and I thought that that conversation was asking uh, everyone else to conform to their point of view. It wasn't a two-way street. I didn't, to me, I didn't hear uh, the, the openness of exchange of ideas. I heard that those people should understand what we do. And it reminded me of the judge in this case. You know, my husband, he's itching a bit on the, the mic because he <laughs> came in here to me after that. And he said, you know what? I have an idea. Adopt a cop. And I said, Ado I'm not gonna go have you adopt. What are you talking about? So why don't you tell them your idea, honey? Because it's 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 really good, but it's exactly what you're saying, Adam. Where'd you go? Sorry, I was trying to. I'm gonna okay. Unmute yourself. Okay, there you go. There we go. So yeah, I don't want to get too far off track, but uh, I I know exactly what you're talking about, Adam, because I was kind of reacting to the same thing. Uh, they discussed coffee with cops and they discussed um, community uh, police academy. And the whole idea of those programs was to try to explain police officers to the public as if their understanding of police officers was, was somehow the most important thing. And I think that the most important thing that we, that we face is police officers understanding the public. Uh, you know, let's face it, the majority of cops are white guys and they might not necessarily be bad guys, um, but most of them don't have a whole lot of experience with people of color. And even if they think they do, you don't get the kind of experience I'm talking about by having work friends 
or classmates, or even inviting your black friend over to a party at your house, because you're still surrounded by your people, by your culture. The only way you get this kind of, of knowledge or experience of, of another culture is by immersing yourself in it and being the minority and, and learning the culture around you that is, is different from what you're used to. So that is where my idea of adopt a cop comes in. If we if we could uh, make a policy that police officers have to spend basically uh, you know this kind of, of time with minority groups, and of course we'd have to have groups willing to to take this on and, and accept these folks. But you know my example was when you when you go to a Kiel's firehouse on a day when they're having a potluck right everybody's just hanging out they're being themselves they're they're you know they're not putting on a game face they're not um you know trying to accomplish any sort of an agenda necessarily um and and that's the kind of time that you need to spend with people in order to really get to know them and their culture so that's that's my adopt a cop idea so we're going to go get cops, other families, and, but it's a good idea, right? Yeah, I think it's great. So Scott, how are we on time? Are you host or is Devon? No, it's, not, it's not Devon, it's Devin uh, is host <laughs> this time. Um, but, and she's going to tell you it's 128. So it's Thank almost you. break at room time. We have about two minutes left if anyone wanted to pose any more questions before we move into our breakout rooms and move on to our next presenter. Well, thank you, Adam. I think your presentation actually brought me a little closure to that whole experience that I desperately needed. You know, I had Christina to, to talk to because she was helping me with that, you know, and in her learning process, but it was, it was a difficult, it took a lot. It was a lot. And I can't imagine how it was for you. Like it was a lot. I'll tell you what, I don't have closure. I'm going to keep working at it. Good. I'll be here. If you need me, you and know, hopefully, that. hopefully one of these new um, things will pass and, and you can benefit from it. Mm -hmm. Okay. I see.